Hello everyone, this is Albert from the Topic Podcast Network. The following episode is brought to you by the Topic Podcast Network. It is a completely 100% listener-supported network, so if you wanted to help us out, please head to co-fee.com forward slash topic network and also patreon.com forward slash topic network. Enjoy the show. Hello everyone, welcome to Mortal Kombat X. is coming out in, I believe, roughly 10 days. Uh, the franchise that stretches back into the 90s, which is chiefly where I was the most receptive to games and so has a, um, I would say, outright nostalgic and that's it. Uh, although there are some aspects where, for me especially, uh, with the nature of the game being as violent as it was obviously I created a bit of friction with um, how often I was able to play and, and what I was allowed to be exposed to at that age where I wasn't able to make um, you know my own decisions with that kind of thing which is fair enough and I completely understand with my parents and um, and when it came to being allowing myself to be exposed to a game like that and there's going to be a bit of storytelling later about my relationship with them um, with Mortal Kombat through the years and what my relationship is it is with it now and what it what seems to be um, most of the world's uh, relationship with it now which to kind of bullet point it I believe from the 90s it's gone from um, very controversial very um, fringe and, and quite risque to um, much much more accepted first of all obviously the culture of Mortal Kombat and the references like in The Simpsons for example with Bonestorm you could tell that Mortal Kombat to an extent permeated the mainstream with the general public's awareness of it um, and so there was always that aspect where uh, it was known for what it was this ultra-violent game which the creators still maintain was simply a stylistic choice which there was no agenda of or of, of wanting to be uh, you know, wanting to be ultra violent for any kind of, you know, uh, you know, excessively controversial, you know, purpose. They they weren't they weren't like particularly angry or or dangerous people. They just it just sort of fell into place when they were developing it early. Uh, what's a way that we can make an impression? What's a way that we can sort of stand out? And over the years, I believe it would have to be close to twenty uh, years that that um, Mortal Kombat has been around of course probably even more um, it has gone from that one very controversial very risque and dang you know strange and dangerous and um, title that many parents were had nightmares about their children playing and being exposed to this sort of um, very taboo uh, especially early on in the 90s, very taboo game, going from that into something where I just, before starting this podcast, uh, um, this Tweety talk, I was watching, I had just hiding my room and I was listening to the three la um, latest combat casts, cast with a K, over at the Mortal Kombat community. I'll put a link to their um, channel in the description. Um, it was... It's a complete, so going from, as I said, the 90s to what this thing was, uh, you know, um, huddles of teenagers around these boxes in the arcade and drawing these looks and hearing these, you know, um, yells and screams and laughter of joy and gross and reactions, uh, going from being incredibly, you know, grossed out to being incredibly entertained and laughing and then anger and, you know, which is... I mean, I was there, you know, I was on the street there experiencing that. I still have very, very visceral memories of of um, Mortal Kombat and, and the sort of role that it had. It always had that kind of air of just forbiddenness about it, and um, that was definitely taken into account with um, the Simpsons parody, Bone Storm, which is, it, it played entirely on that paradigm at the time of young boys, uh, particularly young boys, I'll just say, um, wanting to play that game and then uh, you know, having to face the fact that 
not only was it incredibly violent and confronting for very impressionable young minds, uh, it was, you know, it sold out everywhere because, you know, um, there were people like in the episode, for example, it plays on the fact that there was a very rich kid who wanted to have two copies and the house got a copy and the the notion of it being unavailable was, was very unavailable for controversial reasons and unav unavailable for popularity reasons. That was definitely... Uh, um, portrayed in the Simpsons episode, and it was definitely the case for me. Um, I find my, I found myself relating to that quite a lot. But basically, going from what Mortal Kombat was to what it is now, with these, I've got to say, very jo jovial, very friendly, very community. It's called the Mortal Kombat Community, the channel. Um, look, the fatalities are just are, are no far more more visceral, more bone you know, bone shivering, spine chilling rather, spine shiveringly awful and gross and like delectably gross and exquisitely disgusting and terrifying and violent. Just as no, more than more than they've ever been, obviously due to the photorealism and the production quality increases and the what they can do with the the PS4 and the Xbox One's architecture to realise Mortal Kombat, um, what Mortal Kombat has always been, which is that, like, phenomenally violent and phenomenally, like, wickedly enjoyable uh, game that blows open the, the walls of reality, goes so far, goes so over the top as to now, for me, to ask me personally, it not being something that I can find uh, earnestly, you know, having as 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 having because it's so over the top it goes so far into style over stylized stylized and um photoreal though it may be but so far that it just it just doesn't have the effect of being you know what sometimes GTA can do which GTA can sometimes portray very accurate um you know portrayals of violence but with Mortal Kombat the emphasis has always been over the top like sickeningly entertainingly over-the-top violence, which, you know, Conan O'Brien did with the uh, Super Bowl recently, which gives a perfect example of how uh, it's permeated now. It's found its place 20 years later. Even now there is a place for Mortal Kombat, and even more than just a place. Um, we're looking at a time now where there are, um, as was done recently, the gorolives.com five-hour Twitch stream which I'm going to be watching. I can't wait to watch it. Uh, I've got it preloaded now. I'm going to be watching right after I finish this Tweety Talk, which I saw a few glimpses of yesterday while I was um, enjoying the long weekend here in Australia. It was just, it was just a, a, a great, a, a great thing um, and very eye-opening to see just how organized and just how um, uh, event-esque the whole thing thing felt. I mean, I um, I turned to my girlfriend and I, I basically said, doesn't this sort of feel like, almost like the Olympics, almost like, uh, you know, Eurovision or something. It just has that, that, that feel where everything is made into an event, you know, the hashtags, you know, hashtag punch walk. I found myself Googling hashtag punch walk because Goro is definitely um, the peak of why I am looking forward to um, Mortal Kombat X. Um, the lore, how, how it plays on both um, um, you know, Japanese Shinto and also uh, Taoist and Buddhist uh, um, you know, references to, to culture and, and to even deities and, and certain figures and, and, and story arcs and, um, and narrative components between Mortal Kombat and um, these real-world myths and real-world uh, religions, it um, the parallels are there, and uh, it's it's incredibly intriguing to 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 be actually fully leaping into that twenty years later after this um, franchise has had so long to develop its own culture, so long to develop its own lore and history and and mythology. And many, I'm sure, again, as I said during the Bloodborne broadcast, there are many people I'm sure who uh, just it's not it's not a priority for them to put it gently it's just they don't really care about um those deeper aspects to games but Tweety Gamer is all about taking these games which uh 
not just these games, which you know aren't clearly um, angled towards that the scholarly aspects and the scholarly lens. Um, those are very, uh, you know, those those pro those games such as Bloodborne and Mortal Kombat, um, which don't offer uh, an immediate. Uh, unlike things like Journey and Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, which do very obviously sort of prompt and lead you uh, into wanting to discuss these um, uh, these games as, you know, games as art and, uh, you know, in a more noticeable and in a more easy to uh, talk about um, uh, without needing to explain, because I find, you know, in a much easier way, able to contribute these titles to the discussion of in advancing the interactive medium. I don't expect anyone to come away from this uh, Tweedy talk um, with the, uh, you know, with the belief that Mortal Kombat is a cultural, you know, in in the way that in the way that um, people um, would seriously uh, take uh, the mythological and the religious and the thematic aspects of um, of Mortal Kombat um, to, uh, to realize um, to realize their detail uh, as as Netherrealm have has served to enhance the narrative of the games it has taken a life all of its own with its comics and the and the lore and, and how extensive the the you know the Mortal Kombat timeline I've been reading through that on my walks to work it's absolutely like very detailed and very um, very intricate, but clearly, obviously, having only had twenty years versus hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of the the religions on which it's based, just as a matter of just as a simple matter of time, it, it can't really measure up in terms of detail, in terms of scope to um, um, to obviously the, the the real religions and to the to the real you know the inspirations which you know. Uh, Mortal Kombat took those real-world sources. Um, d Mortal Kombat definitely, definitely, I believe, I genuinely believe, has acted as a sort of entryway for people to then, you know, in this internet age where we're just clicking between links to go to the um, Mortal Kombat section on, I believe it's called cultural inspirations or possibly contributing cultural material. I think, which I was, I was ecstatic to find that there was a section like this um, that someone felt that the uh, that the universe that the mythos of Mortal Kombat deserved a section that, that was this dedicated to uh, it's the substance and and to the real world inspirations and, and, and touchstones of the lore and to the and to the design of the characters you know seeing what like for example with Ra Raiden and with Goro uh, and um, and Kintaro and uh, Kung Lao and explaining all these names and and what they mean and it's just it's it it basically adds a little spice to uh, to something where before the age of the internet it would just be a name it would just be a name in a booklet in a Sega cartridge you know um, box uh, and now that um, we do live in this era where we can just click from link to link and be able to say, look, I, I, I spent an hour reading about Shinto um, deities thanks to Mortal Kombat. It's something that even back when it was at the height of its popularity, I don't believe it, it could ever have had as pervasive an impact um, as, it, as, it, as it's been able to have with the internet age. One of the reasons I decided to uh, re pre order it because at one point I had pre ordered, cancelled, and I actually jumped back onto my pre order was the first 25 minutes uh, that I think IGN posted of the Mortal Kombat X and the game, and just watching that intro and just, just seeing how much, like, how much the, the production quality. And the clear, very obvious amount of hard work and passion has gone into fully fleshing out this um, this universe of characters, this this um, this timeline, uh, the the narr the narration, which I think is done by Johnny Cage. In the in the video, speaks of um, Shinnok and speaks of the Thunder God Raiden and and their struggles and their confrontations and, and just 
basically catches newcomers to Mortal Kombat, uh, catches them up to the first three, um, the stories of the first three, including nine, I believe nine told the story of the first three, and it tells the first three plus nine story, and um, alludes to, or rather, uh, catches everyone up to where things begin at the start of Mortal Kombat X, which has also been supplemented by an excellent, an absolutely excellent um, comic series, which I've been um, following and listening to the recaps of, uh, which have been fantastic. And I'll, I'll, I'll put a link to the YouTuber whose name I've forgotten, uh, which is sacrilegious because I've been watching his content all day, uh, um, a fellow, um, a fellow, you know, interactive medium YouTube broadcaster. I'll just say, um, fantastic recaps and very amusing recaps, rather, uh, of the um, of the Mortal Kombat X comic series, which I I was enjoying so much earlier today, watching um, uh, and listening to the introduction, essentially, of Kotal Khan, who I think was a, an amazingly designed character, uh, it, and as I suspected before reading the comic that the Aztec influence was present. It actually is alluded to in the lore uh, in the comic that uh, Kotal Khan um, was, uh, I, I believe he comes from Outworld, but he was uh, either banished to or sent to Earthrealm, uh, where he was absorbed into Aztec culture. He sort of wandered the planet until he found Aztec culture, and because of his powers, because of his um, appearance and because of uh, his presence, he was he went on to become a leader, and he taught them taught the Aztecs how to fight in the way of his kind, and um, and there's a great relationship there with his father, um, which I'm looking forward to finding out more about. I've really, honestly, had my my mind blown open uh, about um, when it's come to the the lore of the Mortal Kombat series. I've I've I don't know if it's something that speaks to my appreciation for the efforts of the underdog, but the impression I'm getting is that there is a f incredibly passionate community out there for Mortal Kombat who are the furthest thing from what popular culture term and pit uh, Mortal Kombat fans to be like, uh, as in the you know the. Be uh, neck bearding, very skinny, white, all overweight, uh, acne ridden. You know, I think we've gotten far, far past that. But if there are any lingering stereotypes of the kind of um, people who gravitate to these games um, and gravitate to things like specifically Mortal Kombat, where there had been for a long time, this is prior to these times where things like the Big Bang Theory are top rated TV Game of Thrones has I was watching the episode guide of Game of Thrones on the HBO official channel which is essentially an incredibly well produced and well made wikia for the uh, Game of Thrones uh, universe and its history and the uh, the timeline and the characters and the houses uh, and the events and the map and the geography all of that within a HBO viewers guide the same channel who did Breaking Bad, and basically I'm saying that Mortal Kombat has, and geek slash nerd culture, which I think those terms, you know, they have completely had a 180 in terms of their, uh, how people respond to that term, and there's actually much, much more of a, oh, much more is an understatement, an incredible amount of pride and, and belonging that is associated now with geek and nerd culture. Uh, that did not used to be there. They used to be quite derogatory terms, but now they're seen as affirmatives. They're seen as um, very, they're seen as, as um, titles of pride among people. And I, I, I couldn't agree more, uh, especially owing to how connected everyone is and how, um, and how internet and commu computer use across all demographics of people has just shot up. And now computers are just if you can believe this, and I, I would have everyone now listening uh, remember when just the word computer used to be very, very nerdy, very, very geeky. People used to pick on people who used computers very often. Now, and you can all fact check this, 
just turn to your, uh, you know, if you find yourself discussing this podcast later with a friend or a family member, just ask them, when was it the last time that the word computer made you think, made you think of someone who was nerdy or geeky? Computers are now like telephones. They are like toasters now. They're in such common use that they're a means to an end. We don't have, there's, there's very little stigma associated with the computer itself. Obviously, there's still going to be some stigma associated with computer games and, you know, interactive games, um, you know, on console and such. And the word game itself still carries a bit of, um, uh, carries a bit of uh, stigma. I think it was Max Scovel on an IGN podcast recently that said, uh, and I, I, I might see if I can find the exact quote, but he basically said that the interactive medium struggles already with being associated with its sort of adolescent, immature, you know, past, uh, that now with things like, um, I think we live in a post-console warfare age, especially with what's happening with, with Nintendo, which, uh, I mean, there's every, there's every sign that there's a big shifting of the tides happening with Nintendo, who once swore that they would never uh, develop their... Um, games for any other platform now, obviously with the um, DNA merger, or I think one the companies bought stocks into each other and they're going to collaborate on iOS games for Nintendo. Um, it's my belief that the Nintendo NX will be something of a uh, an archive slash next next gen uh, machine. By archive, I mean that there will be a huge virtual console component which will allow you to play essentially all almost all of Nintendo's previous consoles games in a virtual console environment which I'm incredibly excited about and it will definitely reinvigorate interest in Nintendo which has waned it's an objective fact uh, with the reception of the Wii U um, leading up into uh, The Legend of Zelda Wii U which I myself am looking forward to I won't be getting a Wii U just to buy it, um, I'll be playing it on uh, a friend or a family member's Wii U. Definitely looking forward to it and to doing content, 2D gamer content for that. But um, basically, all I'm saying uh, with all these um, sort of uh, touch points, these bullet points about where video games stand now and where things like, I guess what's what I'm saying is what's happening to Mortal Kombat. Uh, the change that's happened in the perception, the popular perception of Mortal Kombat is a symptom of the broader change of the world's perspective on video games and on the interactive medium. It's one of the reasons why Tweety Gamer has come about and where I, why I've stepped out uh, of all of these thoughts and these um, uh, opinions and this, this lens that I've had uh, feeling like it has a place out there, which you guys have definitely proven. And and for the for a time, I think there was about sixty of you who had subscribed. I'm not sure how many there are now. I, I'm I'm just stepping into doing this now after I've posted it. I'll definitely be checking. But for all of you who have um, taken notice and who respond to and find a kinship with this content and with this perspective and and believe in games as much as I do and and believe in uh, the potential of the medium as much as I do and, and how how exciting it is and how revolutionary the medium promises to be uh, leading um, uh, itself to you know I, I think now the industry this medium is just doing its thing it's it knows exactly what it's doing I don't think uh, with the, the, with a few exceptions um, there are some there are some signs of needing to learn from its mistakes and needing to learn from its limitations, which uh, the order 1887, uh, I think, will show us with um, a better balance between gameplay and giving agency to the character and the cinematics. Um, I'm really looking forward to what Ready at Dawn um, do uh, after this and what I believe is the inevitable sequel. Um, I, I'm, I'm obviously checking... I'm checking them every day and seeing um, if if they've they've begun talking about it. Obviously, the game I last I heard it had sold about seven million copies. Um, I think it was in a comparison article with Bloodborne saying that Bloodborne reached seven million in 
four or five days uh, in the same in the, in the in the amount of time that the order took a month to do. I think it was something like that. I might see if I can find that link and put it in the description as well to that article. But um, but yeah, so uh, that sort of ties up um, sort of that that angle there. I touched on some of the Nintendo stuff, which I'll be expanding on in uh, another Tweety talk. Uh, sorry, another Tweety cast, which the one that I'm referring to, there's going to be another... Uh, I referred to it in the introductory video. Um... It was called the Tweety Pitches. So uh, by a Tweety Pitch, I guess I'll use this opportunity to uh, introduce this notion, is um, essentially, they'll be much briefer than these Tweety Talks and Tweety Casts, but a Tweety Pitch is going to be a pretty, a relatively well-realized pitch, essentially, for uh, for a, a either an aspect of a game or for a game itself, unto itself. Um, that I will be just happily putting together. There's this, this uh, outlet that I've created with Tweety Gamer um, to be able to finally put these together and, and get some opinions on them. And one of them, I'll just say as a bit of a taster, uh, is a game based on um, uh, a band, but not in the way of rock band, in the way of a photorealistic third person uh, music esque simulator where for example it would be um, uh, sort of the experience of knowing or being around or being the members of a certain band during certain eras a couple of bands that come to mind are Black Sabbath Led Zeppelin and for more recently Mas the Mastodon and uh, Metallica and uh, and others you know and, and the idea would be uh, this is a a very very small uh, version of what I'll be expanding on later on a dedicated um, uh, Tweety pitch. Uh, the idea is that um, uh, you take this band through their career um, chronologically, as you as you tend to do when you read a band's Wikipedia article. You follow the band from when they joined, from when they met each other, um, to their first few record deals and to their live performances and each each part would have an interactive aspect and it's uh, something I'm yeah looking forward to to putting um, putting together the, the full pitch for and uh, that'll probably be the next one but um, but moving on another thing I wanted to touch on uh, in terms of recent content I've sort of had my eye on um, Pillars of Eternity by Obsidian I I just missed the Kickstarter, uh, however many months ago. I think it would have have to have been almost a year ago that the Kickstarter went up for Pillars of Eternity. I just missed it. I jumped on within a few weeks of the Kickstarter ending, um, as a as basically someone who, you know, I bought the I think the eighty dollar boxed edition, the old school nineties uh, boxed edition, which I can't wait till it arrives. I've checked into my account recently, and it's says that it's shipping. Um, can't wait for it to arrive. It's. I'm very, very pleased to say that it has been receiving a fantastic reception uh, from IGN. I think it got a 9.0. Uh, that, um, for Bloodborne, by the way, it was a 9.1. So, uh, Pills of Eternity, 9.0. Every bit the game that people were hoping it would be, that deep, rich, um, incredibly well-written it was said it actually in the IGN review that the um, the game was a few novels lengths long in terms of the amount of text and storytelling because it essentially um, replaces cutscenes with text and um, and well drawn pictures you know which I've seen some of in the reviews and in some of the gameplay. Um, I will be playing on a Mac, and I may see because of how um, you know because of how I make all my content from my computer and you know uh, my microphone that there may be a possibility of me doing a let's play uh, or a twitch as they say I'm not sure how it works again I'm just stepping into it after a while but um, I would be very very keen to to start a game and, and sort of experience that. Um, uh, and and do something which I didn't have the chance to do in the 90s, uh, both due to, you know, 
not being able to play the game uh, since my, I think, the game I'm referring to obviously is Baldur's Gate, which ha Pills of Eternity has drawn a lot of comparisons to. Um, I wasn't able to play because I, I was the younger brother and uh, my sister played it more often than me and I, I wasn't able to play simply because I was the, little, the smaller brother, so this will be really good, great opportunity. That's something actually that, taking it back to Mortal Kombat, I'm really looking forward to uh, stepping into Mortal Kombat in this era now where this game and this community and this, this uh, um, the universe of Mortal Kombat, the, how it's portrayed now in this incredibly well-detailed photorealistic way, in this incredibly socially connected way, it's, it's much more in tune with, uh, with basically who I am. I, I, I never liked the idea of, in fact, speaking a bit about my childhood relationship with Mortal Kombat, I remember buying, I think it was a PlayStation compilation of um, the first two or three games, and feeling so guilty f uh, after bringing it home, you know, spending my own money, but bringing it home to my father, I felt so guilty that I think I either destroyed it I actually probably broke the game or threw it out a window or something. Or I brought it back to the store. I can't remember which, but it was something like that. And um, again, my relationship with games was uh, was not entirely my own. Um, I They were around the house, and, and for, for the amount of time that I spent with them, they were I became very close with them, and they in many ways supplemented uh, what for many people at that time in their lives um, would have been the main influences and the main thing around the house. Who knows, it may have been films for them, for other people, television, and certainly literature. Um, there were many things that, from, for example, games like Final Fantasy, um, with their very existential protagonists and very complex plots and their, uh, their narrative arcs, which in some cases uh, parallel, uh, will establish ones from literature. There's uh, a heavy suggestion that um, the Final Fantasy XV, at least in some aspects, will include a few Shakespearean references. I think there was a Shakespeare quote in the last, the last, last Final Fantasy XV trailer, um, and it doesn't really come to me now. I wish I could remember it. I'll probably pop it on the screen now uh, if I end up creating this. Um, Tweety Talk with visuals on YouTube. Um, there, there, that was basically my relationship with games. Is is um, I played the ones I was allowed to. I took from what I took from them what I could, and um, and for what I wasn't allowed to play, uh, I may have wanted to play them and uh, and occasionally, you know, asked to play them and sometimes played them without asking and then subsequently feeling bad. Um, it. Basically, it was it was very tied into my childhood, very tied into and everything that comes with being a child, which uh, which um, is restriction and um, your parents being concerned justifiably for your development and for how impressionable kids are. Uh, it's something that I I absolutely now at the age of twenty six, twenty seven this year, can perfectly understand. Um, something that obviously with the passage of time takes a bit of time to to understand and I may seem like a bit of an old fogey for saying this but I can appreciate uh, when a parent doesn't want their child to see um, violent content however however more acceptable quote-unquote it is in this era compared to the stigmas of the past um, there are certainly parents who if they were in the 90s the sort of um, the time when the likes of Ma Marilyn Manson, they were seen as like heavily controversial, uh, to the point where parents, many parents, were since like honestly, earnestly worried about their kids, and their children's um, uh, mental and emotional health and their psychological well being, well being with being exposed to this material, which had so much more of a taboo around it. People were so much less informed and had so many less avenues of finding out the truth. Uh, to these, um, to these, uh, you know, aspects like these um, aspects of the popular culture, 
where now you can just go on YouTube, you can go uh, do a Google image search to be able to see the man out of makeup, research all his inspirations, research all his interviews, find out about the man, watch his interviews, find out that he's far from, uh, you know, a consciously um, demonic and strange, like, like violent, like on purpose wanting to incite violent behavior and suicidal behavior. He's far from that. As, as he's proven many times, he's an artist and he he maintains that uh, his craft is um, chiefly to um, challenge norms and to challenge uh, preconceptions and um, to expand people's uh, tolerances for um, different, uh, for what is different, for what is taboo and for people to make up their own judgments instead of um, following uh, the status quo and for following um, uh, what is basically presented and going past that and, and making up your own mind and thinking for yourself essentially um, that is something that uh, this modern era of um, you know connectivity and uh, you know to different sources of information and the amount of journalism now has skyrocketed uh, with with this uh, this new paradigm of of delivery of information and, and being able to research and absorb information with all the how-tos and with all the you can really really just become a an information nomad and just properly inform yourself uh, and, and go beyond all the main outlets it's something that television stations are they're they're noticeably struggling with um, and the internet is is the reason why you know tying it back to Mortal Kombat um, it's the it's the reason why this this game has now become something almost like by building on what it was in the nineties, of course, but now become something almost completely different. It is uh, it is in many ways much more celebrated and much more enjoyed and much more uh, it it has entertained more and more people because more people have become aware of it. And if uh, we're looking at outlets like Conan uh, with his Super Bowl special where with two um, the two athletes playing the game and even with the dismemberment and disembowelment and the and the violence there's this this it is people are starting to get that this is for schlock it is for entertainment it is and even the creators recently did an article with um, IGN where they basically say look we know what barriers not to cross our emphasis has always just been on you know, in terms of using the fatalities as an example, rubbing it in. It's it's a way of an incredibly over the top way, which can be in many ways quite cathartic to just rub it in to to make something that even though there's things like Super Smash Bros which are addictive, they are um you know, they're they're enjoyable, they're they're great party games. But with Mortal Kombat there's just that extra amount of visceral enjoyment you can get from them and for me Goro, Prince Goro absolutely represents that um, if you can believe it on top of doing all my errands today and tidying my room and, and preparing for this um, Tweety cast, uh, one of the things I was doing was just, I was googling Goro, <laughs> just looking up this character and uh, and I was surprised I was pleasantly um, reminded of how in the Simpsons episode of Bonestorm, uh, Bonestorm rather, sometimes my vowels just take a vacation. It's a side effect of having learned English as a second language. Bonestorm, yeah. Um, but basically, yeah, Bonestorm, um, in the small amount of gameplay, quote-unquote, that you get to see a bot seeing uh, as part of the commercial and you know in whatever whatever scene that you see the game being played um there are essentially two hyper stylized um shokan warriors which is what goro's race is the half man half dragon uh fighting each other and um and for me goro represents just as the as you can see in the latest trailer just pure brutality just ugh, it's just i can't wait that's why i've pre-ordered it in in a, in, in from one point of view, there's many more, obviously, which I'll be going into um, with the remaining. Um, gosh, we'll put we'll put an, another 40 to 50 minutes in this one here if we can. Um, yeah, I 
I, you know, I basically, um, I looked into um, Goro, including looking at his, uh, you know, the history of the, of, of what sort of uh, led to his creation and what led to his character design and and how he once was originally going to have a longer name and he was uh, the story of his tribe was going to be a bit more uh, you know about I think personal vengeance the original plot was that he wanted to restore honor to his race something like that but I what I I'm much happier with um, where he eventually ended up which added a lot to his um, the menace of, of Goro and just the foreboding of just that name, how short it is and how menacing. It's just Goro. You can tell that gore and violence and death await with a name like that, you know. And uh, hence why I've basically made him the thumbnail, made him the kind of the, uh, incorporated his name in the title of the podcast, um, the Tweety Talk. And um, it's just what I find is um, with this channel and my relationship with games now is when I'm, I mean, by and large, and I've said it before uh, with this channel, when you speak, when I'm speaking on this channel, it's a one-to-one sort of, a one-to-one impression of what it's like to speak to me in person and and what my views are. I tend to, uh, you know, articulate my thoughts in a in a certain way here just to make them as clear just for all of you guys and for myself to to be able to um uh, cogently and and with lucidity uh, express my thoughts um for the purpose of having a useful and um and uh, uh you know well-made tweety cast so that I can I can look back and say well that wasn't just sort of squeeing and wasn't just uh wasn't just sort of um glorified um um you know over excitement over over something but one thing uh that i found myself with this is because i am looking at these games um uh, in, in some ways like bloodborne it was some ways unexpectedly i i was not expecting to be taking to these game games as as i'll call them now obviously nothing's a game game because everything has this amazing production quality and and every every game unto itself to an extent uh, is a feat of artistic merit and um, and creative merit, but um, you know, I and I don't. I, I've sort of made a commitment with Treaty Game and not to swear on the channel, but I am very very excited and very very happy about um, um, playing Mortal Kombat very soon and, and playing it with some friends, which I haven't done in a while, and it is incredibly. Uh, I'm incredibly gratifying to know that you know coming into this period of adulthood and independence for me, that I'm able to basically buy my first Mortal Kombat game without feeling guilty. Uh, you know, I, uh, having done all my errands and looked after all of my other um, more important um, life priorities, um, all of that, and to be able to set aside a bit of time to just, I guess, genuinely get into the spirit of, of just having fun and honing my reflexes and sort of um, taking a well-deserved break from working hard. Um, it's something that um, it's, it's sort of made an, a little bit of an unexpected but a very, very pleasant return to my life. And, and um, even though this may just all sound like, you know, the sky is blue, very obvious, uh, information to people who, who are listening who have been long-time gamers and they're they're very well um they're very well very familiar with with what's great about games and, and why we play them but if my sort of re uh my re-emergence into playing games and sort of um my experiences have uh you know sort of served to remind you that um to sort of pause and, and um, not take for granted the fact that this great medium, very enjoyable, very unique and, and um, very just immersive, unprecedented, um, sort of peerlessly immersive and, and enjoyable in, in ways that, in, in such uh, visceral ways and in such kinetic ways that uh, film and television uh, as, as absolutely gripping and as funny and as stomach like side splittingly funny and and uh, you know spine chillingly frightening and everything that that games and films sorry films and television can be uh for me games uh they they're going one beyond they 
with how I with how they're able to synthesize um, uh, everything that we enjoy about TV and and film and music uh, into this uh, amazing package, which I still believe, even if the 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 medium's been around for over twenty. 30 years I feel like saying I hope I haven't gotten that wrong um, it's to me in many ways it's only just begun speaking of which um, what's coming up soon uh, which are there'll be definitely some Tweety Gamer content coming you know ramping up towards the beginning of um, uh, towards the beginning of uh, E3 in a few months time um, I've committed myself to doing a dedicated uh, Tweety talk about sort of orbiting around um, Battlefront, Star Wars Battlefront, which I think I mentioned in the very first Tweety Gamer video, where it was just me sitting in front of the couch. I'm um, looking forward to that. I'll just speak a little bit about um, the, uh, the video filmed aspect. Um, we're going to be testing out pretty soon I think in a, a week or so, uh, when my friend's going to be available, um, he'll introduce himself however he wants to, if he if he decides to. But it's my friend who I've been borrowing the PS4 off of, who is a big Mass Effect aficionado, um, who I will be getting on the couch and talking with uh, about um, his... He's been recently showing me a lot of The Last of Us content, which I've despite, you know, the whole gist of uh, Tweety Gamer and, and my own lens into the interactive medium, um, I've sort of sort of left by the wayside. I haven't as investigated as much as things like Bloodborne and Mortal Kombat. Possibly it's something to do with me not wanting to go towards the most obvious uh, of, um, of games, which I think have already got a lot of content and a lot of commentary and... Um, uh, that discuss their artistic and sort of, I guess, as a shorthand, their deeper merits and their more, uh, their meritorious aspects, let's just say, intellectually meritorious um, and artistically. I, I think um, The Last of Us has a lot of it covered. I mean, it's been, it's been essentially the flag that's been waved for the interactive medium, signaling that it has transcended its adolescent you know childish you know childhood um beginnings uh i find myself saying now that i've i've completely fallen in love with the last of us i think it's a phenomenal game and i can't wait to see what they do with the film and, and everything but i find my just myself just when i'm watching last of us content and showing it to people i just find myself saying the words we have come a very long way from mario a very long way from Banjo and Kazooie and Crash Bandicoot. Uh, it's just something that, just something that you know. Looking at some of the incredible content they've made uh, in terms, you know, Naughty Dog, the guys uh, who made The Last of Us, putting out those documentaries and the One Night Live performance. Gosh, that uh, performance art rendition of The Last of Us was just amazing and so moving and in such a small span of time and, and, and in many ways, you know, all credit to the man but Neil Druckmann by coming out in his very directorial style uh, you know, between the performances I'm not sure if you've seen it if you haven't little spoiler alert for what I'm talking about just go la 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 for the next 10 seconds but basically um, by him coming out and uh, sort of between the vignettes and sort of giving direct you know, sort of breaking the vibe and, and talking more as a director than as a, uh, you know, getting into the mood of it and just saying, oh, that was great, that wasn't great, you know. Um, by doing that, uh, I feel like um, a bit of the vibe was uh, sort of, it was, it was a bit different. I thought it was going to be more sort of one continuous performance, but it was nevertheless amazing. It didn't take away from just beholding that team and appreciating that team, including the, the composer and all the actors and for what they've accomplished and all of them have, uh, uh, I, I believe they're going to move on to uh, amazing stuff and we will be looking back at them um, in the future of the medium as uh, a team, a very important team, a very important time for the medium um, to, uh, in its maturation, you know, and, it, and in its increase in 
the potential for nuance and uh, you know exploring the human condition and and for emotional and thought thought provoking and sort of humanity engaging content you know so that's been amazing as well but um look i'll say it the focus of this tweety talk which i'm i think i might be wrapping it up now it looks like we're getting a bit of a thunderstorm so i want to make all my preparations for that including turning a few appliances off and all that um here in um here in australia but um but yeah I, I, I'll I'll tie this one off as um, basically being my incredibly excited about Mortal Kombat 10. Very very excited for upcoming uh, E3, which is a few months away, granted. But um, um, Battlefront, which is premiering at Anaheim, absolutely can't wait. Um, and uh, and also obviously when we're sliding into May next month, The Witcher, which I'm going to be doing quite a few Tweety talks about, I dare say, including the customary Tweety cast. Um, for the main titles that this channel has sort of committed itself to exploring uh, the Tweety aspects of. So, but anyway, um, thank you so much for listening and for your interest in this channel. Um, I apologize again for how long it had been between the last uh, video and this one, but uh, with uh, with essentially establishing the pattern and the different video formats and content formats which is what i'm doing now in the middle of balancing out uh sort of main life uh work and such it's going to be a bit bit more structured a bit more regular and um and something that as i said from as i've been saying from the very start this is something so tweety gamer is an extension of uh two things one my lens on 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 the medium which um in an unprecedented way in these times with the tools that we have available to ourselves as content creators we're able to articulate and put this stuff into a format which we can you know it's it's an outlet that allows us to articulate these thoughts and these uh, opinions and these uh, you know um, this material that we've that we have in our heads you know in, that's what the pictures are that I mentioned you know but in terms of the whole channel and the whole output I I think this this project of Tweety Gamer is two things. One, uh, about my just who I am naturally, the lens that I have, and and wanting to basically put together a compendium of my own thoughts, just to have an outlet for it, because it clearly is sort of spilling out of me, especially given these times. Number one, and number two, uh, you know, as an incidence to people who, as part of how everything is so connected nowadays, who do want to tune in and sort of partake and for you guys, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very, very, very grateful to, to, to anyone who's ever listened to a Tweety Gamer um, video and, and to a podcast and, uh, and who's looking forward to more content. And, and I dedicate uh, this one and obviously all my content uh, to you guys. Uh, you know, thank you so much. Um, Till next time. Bye now.